Welcome everyone to our last webinar of day one of the Yeovil Chamber Business Fair with Richard James, who's a partner at Solicitors Title. And Richard will be talking to us and explaining about IP, what's yours, and highlighting a recent case that's been very heavily covered in the press about Caterpillar cakes. What has commonly been referred to throughout today as Caterpillar Wars, which may or may not be the correct term for it, um, but we're looking forward to an enlightening and entertaining session. So I will pass over to you, Richard. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Joe. And hi, everybody. Um, on yet yeah, the last seminar of the day, hopefully not the graveyard shift, but hopefully an interesting topic. And um, there's been a lot of uh, coverage in the media um, of, and I'm sure everybody's seen it, uh, the, the M&S and Aldi dispute over their respective cakes that they sell shaped in, uh, as caterpillars and um, so the m &S, uh, developed Collins some time back and launched legal action against Aldi um, over Aldi's Cuthbert version of the similar cake. Now obviously if this had been a proper, well not proper, but if this had been a sort of physical seminar uh, we could have all had some cake that would have been great but um, I don't know Joan perhaps next year that's <laughs> we can have a follow-up on the seminar. Um, I must say I was a bit I won't tell you what I think about the case until a bit later on in the talk but I was a bit surprised really that um, m and had, had made such a kind of bold uh, move given that it's not as though um, Aldi's cake is something new uh, and they had come along more recently and indeed um, I'm reliably informed that there are others. So there's Curly, Clyde, Cecil, Charlie, Morris and even Wiggles uh, via various other major sort of supermarket chains as well. So not totally sure about the rationale of M&S or whether of course there was some sense of it would create major levels of publicity which of course it has. Um, in part because of Aldi's, what has to be said, brilliant response. And I'm no marketeer, but uh, again, you have probably seen that the Aldi's social media people really jumped on this very, very quickly. And not only said that they were going to relaunch Cuthbert, but that any sales or the money was going to go to charity. And then went another step further where they tweeted at m and and said, hey, let's all sort of club together and let's send all the money off to um, you know, various charities that they all support. So whether m and then kind of started to reflect on perhaps this was a bit of an overzealous um, approach, I don't know. But uh, within our, obviously we're a law firm based in the Southwest and over the last sort of year or two, there's been an increasing amount of, let's say sort of threatened complaints against businesses in relation to whether it's their name, their brand. Uh, we had a case, a, a company in Bristol, where there was a complaint about the information that was on their website. So this is a sort of relevant thing, you know, although the media coverage of, you know, the MS Aldi has is, is been quite, you know, fun, quite interesting to sort of follow. Um, I suppose the main thing and the purpose of this talk is to try and sort of use that to, to bring it back to people's businesses themselves. And you know how is this how is this relevant? Um, and I suppose that paints a bit of a picture as to where we now are. Um, and I was talking to one of my colleagues earlier actually, and he said, "Well, if anything, people's kind of brand and people's kind of how they present their businesses in various ways has been really kind of brought to the fore because of the COVID pandemic." And um, if you go back, I don't know, twenty five years ago a business would have been maybe their business name or maybe a logo on the top of their headed paper, you know, when they sent out their letters in the post. Whereas now, you know, our brands are absolutely everywhere, you know, social media and people are much more switched on now as to sort of associating, uh, you know, different uh, brands or company names um, and that kind of thing. So it's really, really relevant. And I, th but I think perhaps people's, uh, what's the word, people's sort of appreciation of what you can do in terms of your business in relation to what you have, or even 
you know taking stock of what do you have that is yours that maybe you should look to try and protect or uh, think about perhaps yeah perhaps hasn't been at the forefront of people's uh, people's minds um and of course as i touched on earlier the key of this is that people associate whatever that is with your business and the hope of course being that they'll think of you whether at that moment to sort of come and buy from your business now or maybe just to sort of build that association over time and of course as i say it's not just your business name but i heard a few years ago so easyjet obviously the the budget airline anybody using their same color orange um again would get you know the lawyer letter sent across on the basis of that color belongs to us and if you saw you know if you saw a bit of a plain livery but without easyjet's kind of name written across it you'd probably still know it was an easyjet plane just because of the association with the color so what this has meant is it's just there's a much broader uh, sort of suite of options i suppose now to sort of think about and you might think well you know we're not easy jet we're not mns in our business but of course actually if you think about it you do have quite a lot that uh you know that's yours um just sort of well see joe helps people develop their websites so all of your website content for example or um so perhaps like documentation you put together so if you're a training business all of that that you give out to clients you know that all belongs to you and those are things that you can look to uh, look to cover so i was going to say at the, at, the, at the beginning if anybody's got any sort of comments or questions as we go along sort of raise them as we go i don't know if there are joe i don't know if there are any at the moment not in the chat so far, Richard. Okay. So, as we're going back to the, the MNS and LD case, the, the purpose of sort of pursuing another business, if you think that they're copying what you do, is to stop them. And the phrase that's often used is sort of rising off the coattails of your, <clears throat> of you know, what you've created or what the association with your business and <clears throat> excuse me i think in terms of mns's approach i was a bit surprised by that I, you know, I believe that's the basis upon which they've launched their legal action at the high court and the truth is because you know cuthbert has been around for some time and then as i said earlier i, I made a list of all the others so you know the other supermarket brands have, to, have you know, created the same idea of a caterpillar cake. Whether one is better than another, I don't know. As I say, Joe, if we redo this next year, maybe we can even have a tasting. That would be excellent, wouldn't it? <laughs> a few eyebrows raised amongst the participants. They like the sound of that. Oh, we've got another joiner. So, yeah, welcome to... Uh, um, another joiner that was perfect timing we were just debating whether we have a cake tasting session next year if we can have a, a physical business fair uh, maybe we'll do a sort of relook at this topic to see uh, so that was excellent timing arriving at that at that moment but yeah i was just touching on the fact that so mns's case was based on sort of others riding off their coattails and that's a perfectly valid, uh, obviously, complaint. Some of the issues that we've been dealing with for clients over the last couple of years have been on a similar basis. But obviously, because Cuthbert and the other Caterpillars had been around for some time, the question is, you know, surely M&S should have pursued that line of argument back at the beginning when somebody else tried to copy what they say is their idea, when in truth, you know, if they've not actually done anything about that over a long period of time, there is a question over whether, you know, really they're going to get very far. So now what MS could have done is 
registered. Essentially, obviously it's, it's a cake, but uh, the idea of Colin is it's a shape. So it's the shape of Colin, Colin's face. I believe they actually sell Colin faces um, just on their own, you know, not, not just the cake. So obviously they've developed their sort of commercial exploitation of that, which they're obviously entitled to do. But the reason that, um, well, the reason this is relevant is what m and are trying to say is that they think people will be confused by the other caterpillar cakes that are available on the basis that they might therefore, um, so on the basis that they might therefore lose trade because perhaps they'll sell, uh, people will buy from other sort of chains rather than coming to them. Um, and yeah, um, there was another case a few years ago involving uh, the familiar penguin chocolate bar and um, Asda before they became part of Walmart uh, developed a puffin bar so sort of very similar same idea and the, and again they um, <coughs> uh, they pursued action against uh, the, of the Asda for basically copying their idea but McVitie's who make the penguin were able to show that they'd actually lost sales as a result of that because unlike um, this example obviously in the supermarket the packaging of the different bars was quite similar and what tends to happen is that you know people are in a rush and they might pick up one thinking it's the other which is the, this idea of you know riding off the cake tails because people will be conf be confused um, into you know whose whose product that is and obviously if that has a sort of financial impact on the first business then they might be entitled to bring you know some sort of action against that so we just had a couple of questions i think yeah richard david's but do you have any experience or anecdotal tales of local companies in conflict with each other either with domains brands or intellectual property and um, i do but obviously as a solicitor we're bound by client confidentiality so i'm not <laughs> as as fun as i'm sure that would be um uh, I wasn't looking for you to name and shame, Richard. <laughs> from, from a few years back, when um, Screepix got very big, a lot of people moved off and they went to Tool Station and then Tool Stream. And there was a lot of um, hoo ha back then. I don't know if it was before you moved down from London about whether Tool Stream, being the second one, could call itself Tool Stream when there was already Tool Station because it got very confusing. Mm. Um, considering they were in exactly the same sort of business, how is it, how would that be affected, do you think, as, as a local case, as in sort of global growth businesses? Um, well, well, for the first brand, it's them sort of trying to demonstrate that there is actual confusion between the two. And actually, I'm just to be sort of, I'm not saying about those particular brands, but um, sometimes it is done deliberately because they do want to ride off the coattails of the other and they, they bank on the fact that although they might get the solicitor's letter or whatever, it won't end up in a full-blown um, you know, legal battle. And somewhere there'll be some kind of benefit for them out of the end of it. Um, I've got a case at the minute, which is uh, our organisations in the Southwest. And one has been around for, um, I think, since 2013. And the other's quite new. But they, they operate in the same sort of sector but they do different things. But the first one um, is really intent on, you know, just sort of clamping down and almost saying that this is this is ours and nobody else can come in, come and sort of play in our park, as it were. Um, when the truth is, that's not really the that's not really the case. So they've been very kind of bullish um, in trying to sort of assert their legal claims. And fortunately for our client, we've been equally or perhaps more bullish back the other way saying actually no that's not that's not right <clears throat> and and what tends to happen is, is people have to sort of then decide do they want you know to go all the way with it or is there some sort of sensible 
discussion that can be had, you know, to try and find a common ground and a way that maybe they can coexist. And, and sort of touch on um, you know, Dave's point, you know, sometimes people will do it deliberately because they will think that it's worth the risk. You know, it's a bit like some of the tabloid newspapers, you know, that will publish, um, I was watching a programme a while ago, and, you know, they were focused on some of the real mega sort of headlines that have been on the front of the, you know, national newspapers. And of course, the legal teams and the editors in those publications have to weigh up the risk of, you know, whoever they're going against, really kind of going for the, the jugular, if you like, and then what, what happens after that, and whether they end up just having to publish some sort of apology, but, you know, for a newspaper having sold all their front page copies that, you know, that week, so it, it still might be uh, worth it. The most embarrassing example um, was a London PR agency um, that we had done some work for, but we didn't do sort of all of their intellectual property, and they rebranded themselves. So they rebranded themselves and they called themselves a, a sort of made up, well, it's not a made up word, it's a, it's a word. And obviously being a PR agency, they did an absolutely stellar job on publicizing their new brand and they had a big like events and everything. And, and that was all great until they got the cease and desist letter from the London media law firm saying that made up word is a registered trademark that belongs to our client. Um, so sheepishly, I got the email forwarded to go uh, help, <laughs> didn't quite get help, said something else. What do we do now? Um, to which obviously to a degree I hit the roof saying why didn't you come to us at the beginning to sort of assess whether actually this was a brand that you could run with uh, and would be okay because it's all very well coming up with a new name for a business or you know even if it's a brand new business but if that name or word or whatever is associated with somebody else they might not take kindly to that and you know particularly if you're a startup it's a bit of a shock to the system I think if you start receiving you know solicitors letters fairly early on it might even perhaps put you off carrying <laughs> carrying on so a, a bit of kind of what we might call like due diligence up front just to sort of see whether that name or brand or whatever you're thinking might be you know workable aside from the fact that if you go with that of course you're probably going to spend quite a lot of money on you know like this PR, PR agency did on you know marketing and websites and branding the last thing you want is to then have to sort of change it not just for the reputational damage to then have to change your name but uh, just everything that sort of goes with that but I suppose it's the mantra of uh, you know looking to things first before just sort of going ahead but obviously quite often there's lots of enthusiasm because it's much more interesting having meetings with the marketing agencies rather than the law firm <laughs> as to what you want to do. So if we go back to, um, again, like M&S, what, what could m and have perhaps uh, done instead? Well, their Colin face, they could have registered that as a trademark. So if you've got something that associates with your business, I said earlier about EasyJet and the orange colour, um, you can potentially register that as being yours. Um, so I guess they could have registered Colin's face and if anybody else had made an exact copy of that or something that was so sort of substantially similar then they would have probably sort of got home but obviously from a practical point of view I guess that wouldn't have made loads of sense because all of the others aren't exact copies of course because you know every um, well I was going to say well I wonder whether you know they all have their own personalities I don't know if anyone's got any views about <laughs> The various uh, ones available. I read the list out at the beginning. So we've got obviously Colin and Cuthbert, but we've also got Curly, Clyde, Cecil, Charlie, Morris, and Wiggles. <laughs> I was wondering, um, Richard, with regard to branding in particular, there's so many programs now where you can get a logo for your business free of charge or incredibly cheap, Canva, Fiverr, and so forth. But how does how do you stand or where do you stand rather on if you've used one of those resources and then you want to copyright it? Because obviously that logo making package 
is a bit like a template, isn't it? There's loads of people who've got the same or similar logos. Can you, if you've used one of those public domain sites, then trademark it or register it? Um, so, I mean, yeah, you should be able to register it or trademark it, but I think your question is whether, can you be sure that actually you're not walking into a problem by, you know, taking a logo or whatever from, from them um, and whether actually it's owned by you or whether, whether it's owned by them and instead they just kind of allow you permission to, to use it. This is often something that isn't quite fully, um, I suppose, appreciated by, by businesses. I mean, a good story of this, you know, sorry, sorry, I will come back to this a slightly different context, was a training development business that <clears throat> came to the firm I was with at the time sort of 10 12 years ago it was a fantastic business what they did was they taught people um, about things like manual handling so helping people move in care homes and that kind of thing and obviously there's a lot of sort of technique in that for sort of health and safety perspective and obviously for health and safety of the members of the staff as well you know because if you're picking somebody up off a chair uh, that home you know doesn't want to have a claim that they've sort of put their back out um, and they had built this business over, you know, quite a number of years. And they had been made a, a multi-million pound offer by a US buyer. So they came to see us and to have a conversation about, about that. And they were quite, um, it was a really good business and they were doing really well with it. So they weren't desperate to sell. So, but they wanted to explore the, obviously the, the deal. And as I say, it was, you know, an awful lot of money. And they could have retired on it. Um, so sensibly they came to us and we did what we called sort of a bit of kind of pre-deal due diligence, i.e. as if we're like the buyer and suss uh, us out, you know, what, what we think their, the state of their business and situation was. And it turned out that these um, training procedures and things that they used all the time uh, had been written by somebody else. And the ownership, the copyright in those hadn't been transferred into the company. So we said, oh, you know, this, this could be a really sort of major problem. So can you just get it kind of transferred across? Because, you know, you could not quite on the back of a fag packet, but you, you know, essentially you could, you could do that. Um, but actually what happened is they had really kind of fallen out, you know, with this particular individual and they just really didn't want to go there. And that was their, that was their prerogative. But obviously we flagged up, well, this could be a really major problem because, almost the core of the business is, is that. Um, and, and, you know, lo and behold, you know, a few weeks later, we're on a conference call with uh, the firm called Jones Day, that's the US law firm, uh, with all of their intellectual property specialists and various people. And they rightly said, look, you know, we, we can't be certain that the intellectual property is owned by the company that we're looking to acquire. And, you know, a painful painful experience i mean fortunately they didn't have to sell and were quite you know content to to carry on but most people i'm sure in that situation um trying to think what the amount was now it was at least two and a half million uh, pounds not dollars so most people in that situation i'm sure would be coming to us going right solicitor's title come on let's get this deal over the line um but unfortunately, you know, that that one thing kind of scuppered that scuppered that deal. So just to sort of start to sort of wrap up a bit now, what we were going to think about is, well, what can you do in your business? And we'll have a bit of a follow up from today's session um, on this as well. So we've talked about talked about sort of brands and things that associate with your business. So you can register those as trademarks. And although you can do it yourself, but it's become more complex in the last couple of years. And we get a lot of clients that um, get really kind of tied up in the process and then end up coming to us and get us to do it for them. Um, so, yeah, so that's good. Um, the other thing that because we do it a lot, we found is, unfortunately, when you put in an application, there are and maybe more, I suppose, given the current times we're in. Uh, companies that try and well try and ride off the coattails of that sending out in bogus invoices to businesses that have been looking to register things to say oh you need to pay this invoice 
So as part of our advice, we really kind of red flag that, you know, early on and say, look, if you get anything like this, you know, it's not legitimate because quite often people just pay invoices when they arrive. Um, so I suppose, yeah, it's just part of sort of looking after our uh, clients and what they do. But also we had a case, a company in Bristol, and um, they had some issues over the contents of their website. Um, so they had sort of quite a lot of technical information on their website. And again, you know, that was uh, copyright. So that was information that belonged to them. And again, that they were entitled to protect. Um, we've got a, another client we've been working with recently who makes a particular type of product that comes in a bottle and they've put together a sort of cardboard shape that goes over the top of the bottle. So we're helping them with protecting that as a registered design. Um, so as a sort of follow up to today's talk, what we thought well, we'd, we'd follow up with a bit of a sort of offer of an audit to sort of help businesses understand what they do have. Um, and then look at, you know, whether they want to uh, look at protecting that or, or sometimes the benefit is understanding what you've got. Um, as part of the Growth Accelerator programme a few years ago, there was some government grants that supported that, which was really positive. And we did quite a few of those um for, for businesses and you know sometimes it's just having that knowledge isn't it about what you have and and then what you can do with it and the, the final point i was just going to touch on is you know what you can do with it so quite often um we'll work with businesses who are perhaps looking to expand and they can either what's called license which is just giving permission to somebody else to use your intellectual property so use your material or use your brand um, if it's your brand then it might be in a different perhaps geographical uh, location and um, so with that you're probably thinking franchising um, which obviously we're all familiar with and we've got a lot of experience um, in franchising people's businesses which is a great way to grow but obviously it's doing it in a way so that somebody else doesn't kind of run away with your brand and your reputation because, <clears throat> you know, a, a bad experience can be remembered. And obviously that's, that's not what the, uh, the objective, the objective is, but as part of a follow up, we've sort of wrapped all this together as a bit of an offer to help people look at, um, you know, what they've got and sort of think <clears throat> about, you know, if they do want to sort of look at, um, moving forward or looking to develop their business, you know, harnessing what, what they've got. Lovely. Thanks very much, Richard. I'm going to take it now to gallery view. And if you're OK, should we open up the floor for questions? I, I think, think we've got a couple more, haven't we? In the... Yeah, Dean had a question. So hand over to Dean, maybe. There we are. <coughs> Sorry, Richard. Um, just out of curiosity, really, how, how, how many of these cases are six level sort, sort of average success rate? If, if, yeah, if um, well, it's a bit of a mixed bag, really, because it's either I suppose it's one of three things it's either a trial, mm -hmm. and so I've currently again, I can't say what it is. I've currently got a, a very well known the owner of a very well known app. Uh, their lawyers have written to one of our clients saying that our client can't operate under their brand name because a uh, sort of word in that is part and parcel of the app. Um, and, you know, frankly, that's a trial. That's them just trying to kind of bully smaller players because they say, look, we are, you know, the, the big, the big I am or, or mm. whatever. Um, but, but as I say, we had, we had a case uh, a, a copyright case where genuinely our, you know, our client was in the wrong. So in that case, it's trying to sort of mitigate the damage. Um, and by damage, I just mean, you know, to quickly kind of resolve the problem. And in that case, again, the other party had London lawyers. And obviously we're really kind of racking up the legal bills and we're looking to pass that all on to our client. So part of the exercise that we did, uh, working with one of my trainees was to actually analyze the time that the other firm had spent working on this case and sort of judging whether we thought that was proportionate mm -hmm. given the the extent of the issue 
Are you talking thousands of pounds in, in uh, a um, week? Yeah, that, that was thousands. So we saved the client uh, something like £1,400 of the other side's legal bill okay. that they, they had to pay because they were in the wrong, um, which, you know, sort of slightly offset the fees that we charged them. So from their point of view, well, from a financial point of view, that was really good. But if I tell you that when the, the MD first phoned us up to sort of see if this was something we could help with, he said, not only had he been having sleepless nights, but, you know, he had been sort of spending hours and hours and hours trying to research kind of on the internet what, what they should do or what the situation was. And yet we had a really nice sort of initial conversation because we really try and sort of do that, particularly if somebody's in a position where they're quite stressed and a situation like this. And of course, we got to the moment in the conversation where you sort of almost heard the penny drop. And he said, well, Richard, I suppose you just do this stuff all the time, don't you? And I was like, well, yeah, just, just give it to us. It's fine. You know, <laughs> we'll deal with it for you. That's that's what it's about. And of course, they went away, you know, really happy. And we, we managed to sort of resolve it for them. But so it's difficult to give sort of percentage, I suppose. But you tend to get a feel for whether, you know, this is either a try on or it's a genuine case or we need to jump on it quick because, you know, particularly if our side's in the wrong, mm -hmm. um, you know, to sort of actually mitigate the, the damage that they're creating for themselves. So, Thank you. So, Dave, Dave, we had a question from you. And hi, by the way. Yeah, how exhaustive must a search be in order to satisfy uniqueness if that's the right word prior to bringing a brand to market in other words is there a a a point beyond which you can establish reasonable um reasonable reasonable certainty that's a great question um <laughs> so well, i suppose the first thing to say is there's no like absolute guarantee um and the reason for that is that you're not just looking for other names or brands that have been registered as trademarks so we get that a lot people will get into a dispute and they'll come to us and they'll say oh but i had a look on you know company's house and i had a look on the trademark uh, you know um directory or whatever which is which is you know great at least they sort of did do that but obviously a lot of businesses will trade under a name and they haven't necessarily gone and got a registration or it might be a sort of tagline that they use um say we well, got you know nike nike or whatever we just do it you know i'm sure that's registered of course but um you know a lot of businesses will have things that associate with them and they're going to have you know right to complain if somebody else um is sort of stepping into that area but the other thing to add i suppose it has to be sort of in a, in the same sort of category of goods and services that they're providing so you know obviously you'll get some brands that are the, perhaps even the same name but they're operating in completely different areas and they're very unlikely to cross paths. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's down to, to what extent <clears throat> is, is the first one, uh, you know, got the right to kind of basically monopolise that name or whatever um, in, you know, obviously can be across the UK. You know, if you've got a UK registered trademark, then it's yours across the whole uh, the whole land as it were or, or even obviously if you go out into uh, the European trademark or further afield so we were one of our tech clients um, end of last year we were looking at maybe looking at registrations for their brands they operate globally uh, obviously worldwide because they're everywhere yeah um, to your example of using Nike and they're just do it how difficult is it because my understanding is you can't trademark the just do it if it's not got the tick because just do it is a phrase that is commonly used in language and speech and therefore it has to have the tick for the trademark is that correct so you can get some names i, I don't know specifically on that question but obviously you can get some that will build up like uniqueness over time um and if that's the case then you know, a particular brand owner might say, look, you know, even though that's a, a reason, you know, a fairly generic phrase that now people will associate that with us and therefore they might attempt to get that protected. The complete flip side of that is, of course, the, the what are they called, the vacuum cleaner brand Hoover, where 
uh, it became so generic that it became the word for the thing. So for, for Hoover, that's that's not good. At, <laughs> well, I suppose it depends how you look at it. I suppose they were quite successful, weren't they, um, with their business? But, well, you uh, can you can get into trouble with just one one word. I recall a case. Um, I think it was about ten years ago between the rock band Muse, and they got got into a spat with Mariah Carey, um, who was going to do a tour. Um, and it was going to be called the Muse Tour, and um, and they do you recall the case at all? They took it, a, took it a court over it. They settled out of court, um, but I think it was driven a, a lot of it was uh, by sour grapes because they the band made a statement after they settled the court, settled the case, saying they just wanted everybody to know they were nothing to do with Mariah Carey. So, <laughs> <laughs> were you were you familiar with that one at all? Um, no, I don't know if I've come across that one. I think Ed Sheeran had one recently, didn't he? There was some issues over something. Right. With, I hope that is right, because obviously I don't want to see some desist from his lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, well, we, had, we had a similar um, similar thing with, right here in Yeovil. We, I, I, you might be familiar with this. Um, uh, Richard Howes is certainly familiar with it. Are you there, Richard? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You remember, do you remember we had that uh, trouble with that Russian based online sports shop that was using loveyoval.com? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the world of d digital and domain. Yeah. They, they realized that, I mean, that's what I, when people search for domain names that they want and they search for it in Google, that's not a good way of doing it because there's people in the background that go, Ooh, they're looking at that domain. I'm going to go and register that. And um, yeah, so they had a fake, website um, selling shoes knowing that we'd come on the door to say can we buy a domain back because we forgot to get the dot com or forgot to get the code uk or whatever it was i can't, can't remember which way it was yeah. and that, that actually goes back to um i think it was about 1999 so if you think way way back to the sort of mm. early early days of the internet or you know the more sort of viable internet if you like and um, there's a legal case it's called one in a million and the these people or this company basically went and registered um, a load of really well-known brand domain names, marks.com, yeah. you know, tesco.com, Sainsbury's, yeah. yeah. um, and on the basis that they owned, in their view, they owned those domains. And then when the brands came along to sort of launch their, you know, e-com websites or whatever, they would be able to, um, you know, one in a million, they'd be able to get, you know, a, a lot of money from them. Yeah. By, buying it off them um, but it what became sort of dubbed cyber squatting because they were just sort of squatting on internet real estate basically yeah when the real owner arrived the real personal frustration with that um is from from obviously my point of view so my name is richard james and some may know that richard james is a very um, well to do Savile Row tailors they do very nice bespoke suits and shirts and all, all of you know apparel and all of that kind of thing um, now that's not to say if I had just registered you know my name as a domain that I could have demanded millions of pounds but if in 1996 or something I'd registered every variation I could think about <laughs> of my name and put my personal blog on it and genuinely kind of used it as a blog site and whatever and blocked out that domain then we might not be here now because i might be sitting on my island drinking a cocktail with the amount of money perhaps they'd have paid me to buy it off me <laughs> i have but, the same thing my maiden name was penny so i'm jc penny the oh. company that owns primark and <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> and owns half of walmart and I've had so many things over the years with posts coming through and that. But Richard, yeah, if I'd known more about it back in the, the 90s when the internet was all new and shiny, I think I'd be sat on a desert island alongside, you know, the, the neighbouring desert islands. We'd have enough for one yeah. age. Of oh, that, that would be good, but, wouldn't yeah. it? it? It still happens now. Domain parking, it's called in, in the industry. And I remember, because our company's been around since 98, so I remember being around thinking, oh, I wonder what I could do. The, the story that I knew was the kid, um, registered 21st century fox when they were still 20th century fox legitimately um, and I don't know what the number is offline but he made a bit of money off that because <laughs> they were like we really need that one <laughs> we're just a little bit silly that we didn't pre-register it and um, while we buy that we'll probably get 22nd century fox while we're here as well <laughs>
and some obviously you know some big brands have you know the whole um you know retainer or whatever where you know they're, they're always sort of tracking what's being registered so that if anything comes along that's a bit similar to, as i say this particular uh, well-known app you know so their london lawyers are looking after all of their brands they're part of a much bigger organization as well it's not just the one app they've got <clears throat> although it's well known um and you know and it's obvious that they're running a whole kind of machine that you know if anyone tries to register anything that sort of crosses over uh any of their clients you know sort of get up brand logos or whatever then they'll they'll sort of try mm -hmm. um and it can be really shocking actually i suppose the final thing to mention it can be really shocking for a business owner particularly if well <clears throat> i was saying i didn't, don't mean particularly but i mean even if they've been in business for some time you know part of what we need we have to do is almost kind of calm clients down a bit to this this happens you know this is just part of owning a business <clears throat> sometimes you're going to get into a dispute sometimes it's legitimate sometimes it isn't sometimes you've done it you know um, not intending to cause any any problem um, and so just feel, sorry um, Dave's point you know beyond reasonable doubt yeah there's no there's no guarantee I mean we do do a uh, sort of clearance process so if people are looking at registering a brand part of what we'll offer is a sort of fixed fee search amongst everything we can find and um, to see if it kind of flags up anywhere um, and obviously if you know if it transpired that it did that that's a good thing to be able to say back to the other you know in response to the cease and desist letter that actually we did do our due diligence and either you know we don't agree that you've got a monopoly over it because we did our work and this is what we think or or at least you know we just show that our client wasn't trying to you know rip off anyone else's brand it's often inadvertent of course um as i say as it was for that pr company that you know it's it's the story that's the, the best story in a way because the irony of a pr company getting that wrong you know going back to our original conversation about caterpillar cakes do you think that actually Marks and Spencers were deadly serious about the cease and desist, given that there's approximately seven or eight other cakes on the market? Or do you just think this is the best PR exercise they could come up with <laughs> during a pandemic? Because I'm pretty certain I'm, I know where my money lies, given that they picked on one other caterpillar and not the whole lot. Yeah, I mean, I think you know part of their, <clears throat> from what I understand, I've not sort of read it, but part of what I understand is, their claim is that, you know, um, Aldi are riding off their coattails when, you know, Cuthbert has been around for some time. So I think, you know, it, I think it's the latter. I think it, it creates the, the attention. Although, you know, any, well, be careful I say, you know, anyone is entitled to sort of advance claims if they wish. And obviously m &S, you know, they haven't just threatened it. They have filed a high court action. So, um I suppose we'll have to see how it plays out, but I would be very surprised if if they were successful and Aldi were told to, you know, cease and desist using um, or, or promoting their their own caterpillars. And of course, as you rightly say, they they've brought action against Aldi. Well, what about Tesco's, Morrison's, Waitrose Co-op? You know, all of the others. Um, but perhaps it's Aldi that's had the last laugh because the the quality of their social media and marketing response to it have just been well in my opinion pretty phenomenal is that did they react in the same way as um uh burger king did to uh or sorry yeah burger king did to uh, mcdonald's because mcdonald's let the the big mac <clears throat> um the rights to big mac slip didn't they or something they didn't renew it is that what what it was i think yeah not quite sure perhaps yeah then yeah if you don't um you have to keep registrations up to date and yeah. they do run out um, and Richard will know from you know, domains, you know, if you let a domain run out and somebody jumps on it, then that's, that can be pretty, you know, catastrophic if, uh, if it's somebody's business because their website's kind of gone and offline straight, straight away. Um, I don't know if anyone's seen the film Coming to America. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Love it. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to remember what it's called. So obviously there's McDonald's. It's, don't it's, got... Yeah, McDonald's. Oh yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty it? close, isn't it? McDowell's. McDowell's, that's it. Yeah, they've yeah. got their own brand of burger chain, haven't they? And, uh, <laughs> and he in the film, I think he makes reference to sort of getting heat from McDonald's. <laughs> They're all dressed in tartan, aren't they? 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, as a marketeer, I'm very interested in all this with brand and everything. Very careful when I'm sort of looking at branding and helping a customer with their colours and so forth. Um, I find it quite funny, actually, ironically funny, um, and I'm going to be careful that I don't get done for slander here. That M and S are, are causing all the uh, are going after Audi um, with this caterpillar cake when Harrods went after M and S for using the green. And m and had to change their green by two pantones to get away from having to use the same colour as Harrods. So I thought that was, I think it is an irony. What goes around comes around, perhaps. But again, legal disclaimer there, please. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. sometimes it's more cost effective just to just to sort of bend, bend and do something about it rather than fight it, you know. Um, and as I say, I'm not quite sure that's m and kind of rationale for, for this one. But, um, you know, as I say, like receiving a, a cease and desist, you know, with sort of threatening infringement can be pretty scary, you know. Um, as I say, the, the chap I mentioned earlier, you know, had been having sleepless nights and really stressed out about it, you know, understandably so. And as I say, the, the, the moment in the conversation when the penny obviously dropped and he sort of said, you do this all the time, don't you? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> just, just send it over. Don't, don't worry about it anymore. <laughs> and, you know, suffice to say, we got an excellent result. Thank you. Okay. Has anyone else got any other questions? For yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, go on, Richard. I've got yeah, a few. Yeah, I've got a question. Just, um, uh, I mean, controlling ourselves just recently got something through to something similar. Um, what we've talked about today and stuff is, is mainly copyright laws and stuff like that when it when you're talking about software and stuff it can get quite complex as well we're re renegotiating a, a, a contract with a, with, a, with a customer where because we run our own content management system that into software that we own and, and, and they've yep. made lots of money from it and then and so there's lots of discussions going on a, on, a, on a solicitor level about ownership of, and ip rights and that sort of stuff if you come across have you come across stuff like that in the, in the past? And then is there, is there a way where you work with other people in the industry that specialise in, in that particular uh, software side of things? Because it's very, you know, copyright is very different than software rights and all, and all the other. So, so software code is, is protected by copyright, but often it's an understanding of who, who kind of brings what to the table. And then when they start kind of combining it or if they develop it as part of that commercial relationship, who then owns what comes from it? Um, we, well, yeah, we do do it in-house. Um, we've got enough capability on that. Um, we've had it a number of times. I was working on a case actually just a couple of months ago. So one of our tech clients uh, are in a very niche sector. So they work with mega brands, you know, mega brands. We've done like premiership football clubs. We've done major media groups. Uh, we've dealt with their US, US kind of you know, council. Um, and quite often it's, yeah, it's, it's settling that understanding in the, in the contract or in the SLA as to, you know, what part of IP rights belongs to who, what comes out of that, who owns that, you know, who's entitled to exploit that. And it sounds like that'll be the sorts of issues that you're, exploring at the moment yeah so is that is the sort of tip there to nail it down from a business point of view um because when we set up our business and started writing, writing our own content management system back, back in the year 2000 i don't think that ip rights was was a, was a major thing is there a is there any sort of tips you would offer people to sort of get pen to paper and, and nail it down first which is which I find quite complicated in, in a moving industry that's uh, evolving so, so fast. It's sometimes hard to keep up to. You only know there might be a problem when you get to it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, part of it is understanding. Um, but yeah, it's, it's understanding the kind of what's commercially under it. So the the client I was talking about earlier is in the ad tech space. So it's understanding how ad tech works and that you know, use of IP, but I suppose boiling it down, it's about going to the, the IP and technology lawyers that actually understand this stuff and how it's managed. Um, because it's obviously you can, what we do is with a client, we'll understand kind of what is it that the client is looking to look after. So for example, there might be some core 
copyright or so intellectual property rights that you need to use again and again and again and you can't have that locked down by this particular client of yours yeah. under their agreement because then that's going to stop you using that again for other things so it really goes to that commercial understanding you know if you're working with lawyers on it i don't know who you're working with but it's that commercial understanding as well as the technical understanding to sort of get that right. And it's pretty mm. catastrophic if they get it wrong. So as yes, I say, yes, right, yes. this particular client uses yeah. us because we've got real reputation in the, in the tech space. We did something a few years back with Flyby as well. Um, again, you know, quite often you'll have, if it's a much bigger organization, then you get their in-house legal team or their lawyers who obviously really need to pinpoint from their point of view, <laughs> you know, ownership and use of IP because it becomes really key, um, you know, if it's in a commercial relationship. Cool, thanks, Richard. Okay. So I'm just looking at the time. We've probably got time for one more question, if anyone's got one. If not, then I'll do the wrap up for it. Has anyone got a question for Richard? Richard, do you, do you recommend that people um, copyright or trademark, sorry, their um, trading names? Um, yes, I do. Um, and not just for the obvious reasons, obviously. Mm. Um, but if you don't have a register, if you don't have a registration for your name or your brand, you st it still belongs to you because yeah. you're, you're trading under it and people will still associate your business with your name. The problem is if somebody... Um, tries to copy your name and really surprised me we have had a few cases recently like this where people are literally trying to ride off literally riding off coattails of somebody else and mm. um, we had one where they actually set up a company called the same name as our client because our client had a good reputation in that sector and they were genuinely trying to ride off the coattails and thinking well we'll just be bullish they might not do anything about it or if they do, etc., they've now the other party have now changed their name. Hopefully, not surprisingly, because we got involved and we said, "Well, we're not, you know, we're not putting up with that." To the extent that we threatened them with an injunction and would have followed that through if it had been necessary. Um, but if if you don't have a registration, well, the other way, if you have a re registration, it's like saying this pen is mine. You know, this yeah. is mine. Here's my registration. You have to stop using it. End of conversation. Oh. And what are the costs involved in, in getting the trademark? So we offer a fixed fee service for £950 plus that, I think it is, which includes the registration fees um, for like a UK mark. Just and, and, then it, and then it's registered for life or do you have to keep renewing it? Um, you get it from, I think, is it 10 years and then you have to renew? Okay. But it's a sort of simple process because most people will just want it to roll. Yeah. But obviously, if you do, well, if you don't have it registered, your issue is if somebody comes along and sort of copies you or is too similar to you mm. and to try and defend that is not just a case of saying this pen is mine. You've then got to try and establish that you do trade under that name. So you've built up what's known as goodwill, that their use of it will actually create confusion. So you've got to try and demonstrate there will be confusion in the sort of market. Um and that you've suffered some sort of loss as a result of them doing that. So it takes it almost away from a, a proprietary thing saying, yeah, this pen belongs to me. You can't sort of steal it almost. Um, to having to kind of almost sort of justify why yeah. you should be, you know, continue to be the sort of sole owner of your trademark brand name, whatever, whatever that is. So, um, and then obviously as I touched on earlier, if you're looking to, Ex sort of develop your brand so you might look to sort of license or franchising it then obviously anyone that you're dealing with will expect you to have you know all these all these sort of ducks in a yeah, row that makes sense um, but sometimes we end up sort of doing that in a bit of a rush last minute because they've got a big contract and it's oh we better <laughs> we better sort of make them look a bit more together you know but that can be quite fun sometimes <laughs> Okay, well, I'm really sorry, because I think this could go on for a long time, this discussion, because it's very, very interesting, but we have sort of now run out of time. So what I'd like to say is thank you very much, Richard, for giving up your time and your knowledge and sharing some of that with us in this last hour. And thank you for all of you for coming, despite I believe there's some sort of football thing happening in the background. So 
I, th I think it's half time because I can hear things happening around my house now. It's been silent for the first 45 minutes or so of this talk. So um, thank you for giving up the first half of whoever's playing football today as well. Um, we're back tomorrow morning at nine o'clock with an hour's networking. Um, then we have um, tomorrow is our hospitality, leisure and retail day. So we have Dave speaking about death on the high street, question mark, not in Yeovil. Um, we also have John Beek from the Wessex Reserve Forces and Cadets Association talking to us about the Armed Forces Covenant, um, which is um, really timely. Last week was Armed Forces Week, as some of you will know. Then at three o'clock, Amanda Whitlock is talking about how to look after your mental health. And then Yeovil College are back for probably the worst shift of the week as England are playing at five o'clock tomorrow as well to talk about hospitality apprenticeships. So hopefully we will see you all at some point tomorrow again. Um, join us for the networking. Um, I will be back online at about half seven, eight o'clock. So if you haven't booked and want to book, I will be able to send you the links for any of tomorrow's events nice and early. Um, and thank you again, Richard, for a very interesting talk. I'm not sure we got to the bottom of who's going to win Caterpillar Wars, but like you say, next year we'll have the follow up with lots of caterpillar cakes, maybe a taste testing. And Helen, if you've taken nothing from this, don't make caterpillar cakes in your bakery. <laughs> so, have a good evening, everybody. Thanks, and I'll Richard. see you tomorrow, I hope. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.